today, Lord God, that Father, you also would give me the power to preach your word. It is not me, not my words, not me standing here, but it's strictly and always through you. So, Father, we ask this in your most precious holy name. Amen. Well, maybe not yet. I forgot to put it over there. First Corinthians 1, chapter, starting verse 26, and we will go through chapter 2, verse 5 of this. So we have been talking for the last several weeks. We've been talking about the unity. We're talking about the visions that are in the church, the visions that, that cause quarrel and cause fighting. We've talked about that intensely. And, and Paul has been spending the last several chapters, or we're going to see the, in the several chapters, that he keeps continuing talking about because it is something that was dividing the church. And it wasn't because of people who weren't Christians. It was not. He was directly everything towards us as Christians. And that's what we've been talking about. And a few weeks ago, we talked about unity and how God wants to be you, the same mind, the same speech, the same power, and the same knowledge. So this is what Paul's been doing. He's been laying the foundation for how to deal with these divisions. And last week, the Apostle Paul showed us how, how God was, was complete, was very pleased to be able to confound the wise and the worldly wisdom um, through the message of the cross. And preaching Christ crucified was a stumbling block to the Jews, right? We, we, we talked about that. Foolishness to the Gentiles. These are the things that we spoke about last week. And, and we saw that Christ is the, is, the, is the display of the power of God and wisdom of God there. But I want you, I want you to think about this for a moment. This is think about your own lives and what's happening in your life. What's been going on that you know from way back since you became a follower of the Lord. All this. I want you to understand this. That, that and, and I think most of us, I would, I would say that we would know whether you're here or you're online. That you would, you would believe this part of it is that God's wisdom, whatever, all the, all the what He gives us enables us to see things from a divine perspective. Right? We see things as we read this word, as we pray, as we spend time with and fellowship with other believers. We see this as a, a, a this is divine perspective, right? We also know that when we're in God's word, that we're studying his word, that we're also, again, praying and being with other followers, that we also realize that not only if we can see the things that from a divine perspective, but it also helps us make wise choices. And another thing that sometimes we forget is that when we do these things, when we're in God's word, when we're praying, we're spending time with other believers in fellowship with one another, we're doing all these things, it also opens up ourselves to his intervention in our, what, circumstances. The struggles that we go through, all these things, everything that we do that we know that as a follower of Christ that we are centrally focused on him. So when these things go the way, maybe not the way we've always planned, but we know that God's wisdom is much better and much stronger. So the question is, why do we still go back to our own human wisdom to do these things? Why do we always go back to our own strength? God, I, I got this. You, you're busy. You're doing this. Or, or maybe even worse, that you don't even trust God would do, take care of these things for you. Because if we've gone through things, and we've tried things our own way with our own wisdom and our own stuff, we know what? We are incapable of delivering results. But God has always, in his wisdom, in his power, has always not in this story. Maybe not the way we like it, but we become stronger through it. So I want you to just think about that as we're, we're continuing what's going on in, in, in Corinth. But what else do we need to know? Right? Paul has been explaining things. So what else do we need to know that we can keep us from doing that fighting and keeping that division? Like I said from week one, that we, I truly believe we're not a church of divisions and all that because we're here. We, we, we have the same mind. We, we know what it is. You don't come here to see me. You don't come here to see Pastor Neil. You, you come to see Jesus. You come to see God's word um, here. And, I, and I, I totally believe that. But but we don't if we don't want to get like these Corinthians, we don't want to get like other churches in today. We, then we have to stay focused on those things and focus on only on God Himself. So the Apostle Paul he continues to teach these Corinthians more foundational truths, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to continue in the part two of the wisdom and power of God. 
And we're going to see why God's wisdom is way superior than humanism. And, and the first thing that I want to share with you is that the paradox of God's wisdom. The paradox of God's wisdom, right? And then just in case you don't know, the meaning of a paradox is, is, is a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement or proposition that when investigated or explained may prove to be well-founded or true. And what we're going to see that unfolded here today in the first few verses. But I want you to look at verse 26 of chapter 1. And it says, For consider your calling brothers. Okay? We'll stop right there. Consider your calling brothers. So you know right there he's talking about Christians. Now, but what else does that mean? Now, we're, we're small here today, but what I want you to do is I just want you to look around. Go ahead, just look around the people that are in, your, in this room right here who's sitting near you. Uh, just check them out. Right? Consider, consider your calling. He's saying, look at the calling of believers that he's put together. Look around you, brothers. And what does he continue, right? Wait a minute, I'm not done yet. He said, what? Look around you, brothers. Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you are wise according to worldly standards, right? Not many of you are wise. Do you see any philosophers next to you? Do you? What else does it say? Not many of you were wise. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. Do you see any of the world's great minds here this morning? In, in the worldly wisdom, the world, and, and what, uh, human wisdom, do you see not many are powerful? Do you see the world's greatest intellectual people here this morning? Do you see any of them like that? It says not many noble. Do, do, do you see kings? Do you see princes? Do you see people born in, in high places? Their parents or whatever, or noble, or their parents are kings, or their 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 delegates. Do you see that? You probably look around and say to yourself, "No, we're just simple old normal folks here." There's old Joe over there, Mary sitting over there, Bill. I'm not mentioning no names. I'm just making fictitious names for this. But we're just seeing ordinary people sitting here. I say, I don't see those kind of people here. Where Paul's here, I don't, I don't see them. Can I say this to you? God had a purpose for that. God had a purpose for just exactly that. See, being wise, being influential or well-born cannot possibly be the criteria for being a Christian. See, Paul proves this by asking them to consider themselves when they were called. Who are the ones that received the message of the cross? Were you wise? Were you mighty? Were you noble? Because you were not wise according to worldly standards. But here is a, is a wonderful truth that God has given us. Because God is not impressed with who we are or any of our achievements. He care less. He doesn't care what you've done for this world. The very things that put these people in this Corinthians ahead in this world do nothing before God. In fact, if anything, these people put God behind. See, being wise by the world's standards or powerful or noble are things that are written off by God as having no eternal significance. It is the feeling of inadequacy that makes people aware that they have a need, and that often draws them to the gospel. Look at Matthew 11, 25 and 26 says. At the time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. As its context in this makes clear that, that this prayer was spoken publicly as part of his preaching to the crowds. But you also understand that he was also, as he was
when he prayed these words. He wanted them to know that God wanted only their faith and nothing else. But he was also warning them. He was one of the wise and understanding, the ones that were intelligent, right? They were at a disadvantage as, as being spiritual, like, and un, understanding their concern. You guys are at a disadvantage because you think you know it all. You think you're wiser than God. You're at a disadvantage. See, it's not that they could not accept and believe. If that has nothing to do with it. But the pride in their independence on their accomplishments and on their abilities would keep them from the kingdom. Weakness and insufficiencies are in which God's strength is made known. The Bible is clear. Paul talks about it in many places. Then this statement is referring to those who think they can figure out life without God. Because, in a sense, most of us in this room probably felt that before they came in our Lord. That we could do it ourselves. We don't need Him. I know for sure I did. And this is why God's wisdom is a kind of a paradox. This is what John MacArthur said. He says, in human thinking, strength is strength, weakness is weaknesses, and intelligence is, is intelligence. But in God's economy, some of which seems to be strong things are the weakest, and some which seems weak things are strong, and some of the wisest things are the most foolish. The paradox is not by accident, but by God's design. You see, a simple, uneducated, untalented, clumsy believer who has trusted in Christ as their savior and who faithfully and humbly follows Christ is immeasurably wiser than any brilliant PhD that just scoffs at the gospel. Just makes fun of it, ridicules it. You see, the simple believers know forgiveness. Simple believers know love, they know grace, they know hope. They know God's word, they know God himself. Civil believers can see eternity. <clears throat> the unbelieving PhD, on the other hand, knows nothing beyond their books, their own mind, their own experiences. They see nothing beyond this life, and that can be, and they see what we believe is foolish. God is always telling us, and you've heard me say this many times, to understand who we are in Christ. We must always remember that ourselves, in, in and of ourselves, we are nothing. We're nothing. It's only by God's love. It's only by God's grace and power that we're made to be something wonderful in God's kingdom. So rather than thinking in terms of what makes one valuable or important in a worldly way, we really need to consider what God has done for us. Us. See, so God did not choose the kinds of people the world would praise, right? God chose us to delight the nations and bring glory to the God, right? So let's look at these verses 27 and then 28. It says here, But God chose you what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And that word despise means, in the root form, it means to be considered as nothing. Now you understand that, that, that he's talking to believers, and a lot of these believers are Greeks, so keep that in mind. So people, what he's saying is so people who thought they were nobodies in society would continue to be thought as nobodies. And the phrase things that are not translates the, as the most dis, uh, disgraceful expression in the Greek language. So what do I mean by that? Remember, Greeks. Being, the word being, was everything to the Greeks. It was everything to them. So to be called a nothing was the worst insult they could be. That phrase was used a lot when it, was, when it came to slaves. So the Greeks took this as a very bad thing, an insult to them. You see, the world measures greatness by many standards, right? At the top, what are they? Intelligence, its wealth, its prestige, its position, which God has determined through his word they're at the bottom of my list. 
See, God reveals the greatness of his power by just demonstrating that it's, it's the world's nobodies that are somebodies. And according to God, the greatest man who had ever lived, besides Jesus himself, do you know what the word of God says? Who was the greatest man who ever lived besides Christ? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Did you know he had no education for the most part? Right? He, he, didn't, he didn't have any degrees. He, wasn't a, he didn't have a doctor degree. He didn't, he didn't know those things. Did, did you know that he didn't have any, really didn't have any formal education? Did you know that he really had no particular power? Did you know that he was a strange character? I mean, he, he, he wore clothing, clothing that was made out of camel hair, and he, he ate locusts and wild honey, and he lived out in what I would call the boondocks. Well, maybe you might say, well, when he was born of noble birth, do you know his parents are? I mean, I mean, think about it. Elizabeth and Zacharias, right? They were nobodies. Well, you say, well, Zacharias was a priest. Yeah, he was a priest. But there were thousands and thousands of priests, and they had no rank. But Jesus said in Matthew 11, 11, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there is none, has risen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. God doesn't need a PR agent. He doesn't. His word does not need support from our human intellect or, or, or political power. God does not require numbers or, or bigness to accomplish his purposes on earth. He doesn't need people with a bunch of letters behind, behind their name. God chose John the Baptist to be a messenger who would what? Prepare the way. D.L. Moody. This is just how great God is, man. This is how awesome he is. And you, you should really, we should look at him in a, in a brighter and a glorious sight when you hear this stuff. Dale Moody was a great 19th century evangelist. But you know what he did? He butchered the king's English. Yet God used him to reach students at one of the greatest learning centers of that time, and that was Cambridge University in England. Some students would come and they would just try to heckle him off stage, get him off stage, try to do whatever they could do to get off of there, right? But he began his message with, this is, what, this is his words, per words, what he said in the opening statement. Young gentlemen, don't ever think God don't love you, for he do. Now, if any of you are English majors, you know that is a bad English. But guess what? The message reached those students' souls. As bad as that English was, the message reached that, and some of them came to Christ. Do you realize that if Moody was born today, he probably would not be able to get enroll into the Moody Bible Institute today? Let me bring you a little closer. You all know, you should know, I've told many people that my life verse is Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of everything, he began a good work. You perform and perfect how you want to work it till the day he returns. But do you know verse 27 here is probably the second closest life verse to me? Verse 27. But God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Let me tell you something. That verse helped me immensely. There was a time when God called me to ministry and I'm saying, God, there's no way. I can't do it. I, I, I don't, I, I, I don't, I can't. I, I can't speak well. Uh, um, I have, you all notice, I have, I have comprehension problems. I, I can't comprehend things very well. I, I, I even in a men's Bible study, when, when Pastor Dale is leading it and, and he's got questions, I, I, I have to read the question over and over and over to try to comprehend it. And so I think, God, how am I going to be able to read, comprehend the Word of God? How am I going to be able to share this? And I'm not talking about when I got to adulthood. It's when I was teenagers. I said, okay, well, you're giving me teenagers. Well, that helps a little bit because, I mean, I, I'm probably smarter than they are. So that would help me. But I still have this this 
overwhelming. No, I can't do this. Even today, my English is terrible. I was a nobody. I was nothing. I'm not qualified. I don't have those degrees. I don't have all those letters behind my name. But after some time, God has revealed this verse to me. And this is what I've learned from it. And even today, I have to thank him for it. Because the power of Christianity, it is not, it, it's in its message. It's not in the messengers. It's not me. And God said to me, if I wanted someone else, I would have chosen them. But God said, I chose you. I don't take what I do here, even when I start ministry, when I was teaching before I even had a degree, but I was just teaching. I don't take this for granted. Because I know who I am in Christ. And I know what it takes to do this word. And I don't say this just to say it. I don't say this to, to, to say, oh, look at me, look at me. The problem here, as it was with me, and maybe it was you, the Corinthians here were looking at things from the wrong perspective. Here's the thing. If you have low self-esteem, if you experience significant struggles, or maybe you've been despised by people, then guess what? Then you can be used for his kingdom. If you feel like they feel like that, if that's part of you, I just want you to take note. I want you to take hold of this. Then God wants to use you. Everyone in this room is usable by God. Everyone in this room has a purpose that God has for you. You've heard me say this many times over. We are not put together by, by, by chance. It was God's design. Do you realize when Sherry and I, when I was called into this ministry to plant a church at Brooklyn Park, none of the original members of this are here. But some of the original members brought other people that are here. And even today, some people aren't here have brought other people. Because God's design. We don't know what his, what his ultimate plan is with this church, but we do know one thing. It's to preach the gospel. For all of us, the share of the gospel. And that leads us to the second point. Not only is the paradox, it's a, it's a strange thing that God has done here, but the purpose of God's wisdom. If you are a child of God through Christ, it's not because of who you are, but it's actually in spite of it. The first and, and primary purpose of the wisdom of God that produced salvation is that he would be glorified. Verse 29. I'm going to read verse 28. God, just again, God shows what is low and despise the world, even things that are not to bring nothing, things that are. Verse 29. So that new human being might boast in the presence of God. Here's a thing I want you to, I want you to share with you. Look at back at the first beginning of, of 28. What are the first two words that it says? Start saying. What are the first two words it says? You. God chose you. Each one in this room, God chose you. You didn't choose God. He chose you. You were saved because you were chosen by God. 
it's a fine line, right? Because I, I used to grow up in, uh, when, I, when I first got saved that we accept the Lord. But did we accept the Lord or did we actually see the Lord? It's a very fine line, right? Because it says those who knock on the door and you open, right? You're being received. God receives us. He chooses us. Yes, we have the free will. We have to accept it. We have to deny it. But he ultimately starts with him choosing, choosing us. So, you look at verse 20, it says, God chose, that should help you with verse 29. Because it says, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. In other words, when he says, here I am, God, remember me, I'm the smart one. I'm the one that came to you. No, we don't boast. Isaiah 42, 8 says this. I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to card idols. He says, look, I'm not sharing my glory. And he has every right to say that. He has every right to say that. Only God is all the glories. He is the only one who gets that. He alone deserves the praise. And when it comes to his glory, God doesn't share. Nor should he. What's nothing we did? Look at the next couple of verses. For it's by grace, from Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For it's by grace you are saved through faith. Right? Not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's a gift. God's giving you a free gift. But then what? Not a result of works so that no one may boast. In other words, you and I will not be going around bragging in heaven on what we did. The only bragging we should be doing about the awesome grace of God for saving us, for rescuing us. That's the bragging that we can do. Not what we did, everything we did. See, but God also um, has a purpose for those who are saved. And his purpose is, is, is redeemed. It has many parts. If you look at verse 30, we're going to spend a few minutes here in verse 30 here. It says that because of him, who you are in Christ Jesus. Okay? What's the next word? After Christ Jesus, it says, who became to us wisdom. Wisdom. Wisdom is the ruling word in this in this Greek sentence. It's righteousness, sanctification, redemption, we're going to see those. Those are expand what God's wisdom means. It's God's systems of salvation. Christians become Christians by God's wisdom, not by the wisdom of works or worth. So as soon as you became a follower of Christ, the first thing you received was wisdom. Right? The Holy Spirit comes inside of you. You now have God's wisdom. We were given God's wisdom to replace our own wisdom. Who are the truly wise in this world but those who know God? Who are the truly wise in this world but those who know salvation? Because God has given you these things. We are what? The wise. We stand as a testimony for God for all time. That God took simple humble people who don't didn't know enough to do anything to redeem themselves to transform us right who didn't have the mind and the mental abilities of the best of this world and he made us the wise, wisest in existence and he is, is the glory again we're not saved by our intelligence we're not saved by our accomplishments we're not not even our own human wisdom those that put their trust in these will never receive God's salvation. God's wisdom only comes to us by humbly receiving what his son has done on our behalf of the cross. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people who think that if I'm a good person, I'm going to heaven. Unfortunately, there's a lot of churches who think that, but this verse very clears it up right here. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You must go through Jesus. It has nothing to do with your works. It has nothing to do with your worth. 
And this is why, even if they say they're going to heaven, you should always ask, why do you think it? If they can't tell you how they got saved, pray for them. Because they've been deceived by the devil. But there's also another verse. John 8, 31, 32. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Who's the truth, church? Christ. Only Jesus Christ can set us free. So now I'm going to get wisdom. The second word in verse 30. Because of him you are, who are in Christ Jesus, you became to us wisdom from God. Righteousness is the second word that I want to share with you all. Fathers receive God's righteousness. We are made right with God and we participate in that right in his righteousness. Righteousness, just in case you don't know, means before God, you stand right as opposed to wrong. You stand good as opposed to bad. You, sit, you stand sinless as opposed to sinful. You say, you mean when I, when I respond to Christ, when God called me, when, when, when I received him, I, I, I believe that I stood right before God? Absolutely, because here's the verse that says that. 2 Corinthians 5, 2, 1, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we, church, we might become the righteousness of God. God bore our sin so that we would not have to stand before God because we are condemned. So God, Jesus, Jesus came, he died, he was buried, he rose again, and that took away the sin, all of our sin, past, present, future, so that he stands in. It doesn't give you a right to sin whenever you want to sin, but it's huge because we don't stand condemned. Because of the person trusts in Christ, his unrighteousness is exchanged for Christ's righteousness. Philippians 3 9. And be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Because guess what? We have no righteousness of our own. Paul says, I want, Paul says, I want to be found having his righteousness. You see, it's a wonderful thing to realize that when you're saved, you not only get wisdom. But you also get absolute and total righteousness before God. Your sin, my sin, is done away with. It's because Christ paid the penalty on that cross. And with that, God was satisfied. When you receive Christ, he took up residence within you and and. And I, and through the Spirit. And we're going to talk about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit next week. But this is what He gave you His righteousness. And you see, the key to a follower's life with Christ is not you or I living it, but Jesus living it through us. That is what makes Christianity so unique. Christianity is not just it's not a religion, it is driven by relationship. That's key. Third, wisdom, righteousness, but the third word here is sanctification. Sanctification. In Christ, we are set apart. You are different than the world. You're made holy. The only, but there's a huge, there's a, the, the, the biggest difference, of course. We have God, they don't. Other than that, we still have to live. We still uh, we still have to work on our on our walk. We still have to do things. So he not only declared, he not only said that we were righteous, but he began an inside work of making you holy. He started beginning an inside work of setting you apart. You know the moment you believe in Christ, the principle of the incredible seed was planted in you. This is what first John three nine says. 
Oh, I meant for the word, sorry. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides him, and he cannot keep on sin because he has been born of God. Church, that's a big thing right here. That's a verse that we should take note of. We're going to sin, right? That's not what we're saying. Key word there, practice. We continue to keep doing it with no regard to God. God, when he wants to set you apart, he's made you righteous before God. We've already talked about that, right? He's given you the wisdom. You know the spirit, living inside of you. You've been made, you've been, you've been righteous, you've been, God's given you his righteousness. Now he's working on you from the inside out to set you apart. As Pastor Darrell has always said in the past, he says, I don't, it's the people who, who, who sin, who, who know about it and are working on that, that's okay. It's the people who sin and don't care, that's the problem. That's the question that you need to really find out. I'm not saying you in this room, but that's what people need to find out. Are you truly saved? Because according to this verse, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. They don't say, all right, I asked the Lord in my life, and then they go live their life the way they want to live their life, the way they did five minutes before you said yes to Jesus. Yeah, do you struggle? Absolutely. Again, we'll talk more about that next week. But yes, you absolutely will continue to struggle. But you're not practicing you're not keep continue doing the same as you did before. You realize that the Holy Spirit is working you and convicting you of those things, and you work to get rid of that. You work on those things through prayer, through reading the Word, through fellowship with other believers. Confess your sins to one another as the, as the Word of God says. We need to work, help each other out. We're not here to, to ridicule. We're not here to put you down. We're here to help. We should also be here to help each other, to grow. That's what we're called to do as part of it. See, when, when we place our faith in Christ, God gave us a new life. Right? What John says is, is God's seed. See, we're given a new life in, in, in the spirit, and we begin to walk in the spirit. And this is what Romans 8, 4 through 8 says. In order that we, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for he does not submit to God's law. Indeed, he cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. It says the word walk refers to the entire way of your life. So when we walk, it's our entire way of life. So if we have a problem with our walk, it's not our feet that's the problem. It's with our mind, because we're set our minds are on the flesh and not on things above. So when this happens, when you start becoming sanctified, when God's working inside and out of you, and you start to grow in all there, what's the next thing that happens? Look at Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against these things and no, no such law. In other words, God starts to create these things in your life. You start becoming more loving to people. You start becoming more patient to people. You start becoming more, all these things is part of your growth. This is how you know you're growing. And, and Paul is telling these Corinthians that this is where you should be going. When we get to chapter 3, we'll talk about the solid food and the, mil and the milk. But this is where you should be going. Paul's speaking about being made to resemble and to reflect Jesus. Not only in our attitudes, but also in our actions. And when these things happen, when we start working, then we make Ephesians 2.10. I must have missed that one. Then. Oh, no. oh, sorry. We have this one here. First, Second Corinthians 3.18. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed in the same image from the one degree to glory another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We start working in this direction. And when all this happens, our new nature becomes Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in him. See, we work. Your works don't mean nothing. 
but your works in Christ mean everything because you're now working because you're working for Christ. So your actions, your attitudes, you're, you're showing that love that you didn't have before as a sinner. Oh, you may show the love in a certain way, but not the love that Christ showed you when he died on the cross. So if that is a part of that. So we've seen God's wisdom. We have seen his righteousness. We, we have seen that we've been sanctified. But lastly, he says, followers receive God's redemption. And to redeem, the redemption means to, to buy back. Redemption was often used when they, the freedom of slaves for ransom. They would pay a price. They would be free. Christ paid the price so they become free. God, by Christ, has purchased us from the power of sin. But Ephesians 1.14. Who is the guarantee for our inheritance until we acquire possession of it? The praise of his glory. Who is the guarantee? Uh, so that was an interesting word. Paul says, the Holy Spirit is God's guarantee. The guarantee that God will do everything he promised to those who are saved. And it starts with eternal life. But Peter reminds us something about this as well. First Peter, chapter 1, verse 18, 19. Knowing that you were ransomed for the few ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Amen. Think about that. Our bodies before Christ were dying every day. Why do you think as you get older you have more wrinkles than you did when you were younger? Your body breaks down and falls apart because you're dying every day. And one day without Christ, you would spend all that, your, more, your body in hell. But Jesus says, I made you a new creation. Though, yes, your body is breaking down because of the sin, but one day, your body will be perfect. You won't have to worry about those aches and pains. You won't have to worry about waking up and feel like your, your legs are about to break because you can't stand them because you've been so, they're so weak. You can't worry about when you go down and pick a pencil up. You don't worry about when you pick a pencil off the ground, all of a sudden you pull your back out. Those things are over. I'll tell you, I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that. The older I get, the more I feel like I'm just... You know what? You might not know it. You you will soon if he doesn't come back before that. He goes on. Verse 31. So it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now, what Paul is doing, he's, he, he quotes in Jeremiah, right? So let's go to Jeremiah 9. In verse 23 and 24, it says, Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. Verse 24. But let him who boasts, boasts in this, that he understands and knows me. But God himself, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Paul saying, this is it right here. You're not going to boast in yourself. It's because of me is why you can boast. I'm going to tell you to boast. But he also says in Galatians 4, 6, 14. But far be from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord, Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Notice that our joy, that our hope, that our strength is to exist only in the fact that we understand and know the Lord. Paul says it was the cross that changed my relation to the world. It was the cross that made me a new creature, recreating me. So I'm going to give honor to that cross. I'm going to give honor to Christ. I'm going to put no glory in humankind. I'm not going to, my human, no, I'm not putting no glory in that. Because this is what happens. When we do that, this is where the divisions come into life, into church. Again, it's not about us. We do not glory in our wisdom, in our might, in our wealth. All status that we have on this earth have been torn down through the message of the cross. And it's very shameful when our eyes leave Christ.
that leads to cross. Because as a follower, everything we need comes from Jesus. Everything. He is our all sufficient, right? Worldly wisdom gets you nothing in the end. But the, and the so-called foolishness of God gives you access to all we need and more. So we see in the paradox, we see in the, the purpose, lastly, God's wisdom is superior to human wisdom because in the presentation. So to bring this out fully, right? To bring it out fully, Paul shows his Corinthians that this is what he practiced when he was with him. And the verse we're getting ready, Paul demonstrates that is that is that is also is not presented through human wisdom. I didn't do this with my own words. Paul didn't come as a philosopher, he but as a witness. So he says to the king, so verse 1 of chapter 2, and I, when I came to you, brothers, I didn't come proclaiming to you the, te the to the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. And testimony means just that, a testimony, it's a witness. You and I can only testify to what we ourselves have seen or have experienced. A witness in a courtroom Right? You, you, you ever listen to one of these things? You ever been had a call for jury duty? They are witnesses only to report what, what they know is objectively, that it's as factual and personally. They, they, can't, they can't do hearsay. They, they, they're not to speculate. They're not to, they're not to guess. They're not to assume. And that's what we do. You've heard me say in the past that... We can share the gospel with people, and they say, yeah, that's just a bunch of men that didn't write words. But you can share your testimony, and they should not say anything about it because it's you. It's you. And we don't glorify our we don't glorify our past. Listen, that's not the key. We give, we tell our we tell our testimony how God saved us so we can glorify him. That's the purpose of it. A lot of times I, I've heard testimonies that everybody just makes their past so like, oh, I was this bad person, blah, 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 all this stuff. And they give just, oh, and then God came and saved me. And then all the influence was on their past. Yes, we give it because that's that we have to. It's our testimony, right? It's where God was. Paul prime, was a prime example. We read through Acts. He said, I was like this. When he came in and everything changed. And everything from that point, he stopped talking about his past and he went forward. So we tell our past. We tell him how, how wretched we were. But it's not the glory of that. It's to bring out God's glory for what he did for us and through us. See, Paul was a witness to God's revelation. Paul was a witness to that. Not to his own human understanding, not a reason or his feelings. And Paul did not see, I'm not doing that. I did not come to Corinth with opinions of speech and wisdom. That's what he's saying. I didn't do that. I didn't bring them to the things that the world values. Paul didn't engage in self-promotion. Like a lot of times when, when, when the uh, speakers who would travel from city to city, they would tell you, I am a Dr. So-and-so, and they got, I'm a, I have a degree in this, and I have a degree in this, and all this, and I'm this, and I'm that, just to puff themselves up. Paul said, I didn't come to you with any of that stuff. We, we went over that week one of 1 Corinthians. We went over that stuff. Paul brought one message. That's all I'm here for. I'm going to give you one message. I'm going to proclaim the message of Christ and him crucified. That's what he does. That's all I'm going to do. Because here's the thing, church. People are supposed to hear the word of God proclaimed. They're, 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 they're supposed to hear the, the word of God declared. We, we, we want to say, what a wonderful Savior, not what a wonderful preacher. It's never about us. Paul was not trying to impress. He just simply brought the message. And that is my goal. And I believe that, that I would bet my life that's Pastor Darrell's goal is to bring just the message because it isn't about us sitting here. It's all glory to God. See, we shouldn't come together. We shouldn't go to churches where hear the preacher's opinions or, or his or his public or his politics or psychology or, or his economics or, or finance or even he shouldn't even talk about religion. We come, we should come to hear the word of God through the preacher. 
our lives must be shaped by this idea where we are pointing people to the cross, not to us. See, people will hear the word of God from us, not the opinions, not wisdom of the world. We, I want to see Jesus and I don't want to see myself because I'm, I'm icky, I'm, I'm miserable, I'm terrible. But through Christ, he makes me who I am. And Paul warned Timothy about these people. Look at 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. Now it's very correctly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the sincerity of liars whose conscience are seared. Are we not seeing that today? It's out there. The, the, the conscious, right? The rightly trained helps us to know right from wrong. But these teachers, these false teachers, I should say, have burned theirs to the point that people are numb. They, they, they no longer discern goodness from wickedness. People should be, when we're in dire straits, people in the world should be coming to the church. Hear what the, the preacher preaches. But unfortunately, some do, but they're false teachers. They're coming to get their ears tickled. Because they don't want to be told what they're doing wrong. They look at the Bible, and some unfortunate preachers do the same thing as a feel-good book only. And they never point people to the cross. They point, oh, you can live your life successfully doing this. But nothing has to do with God. But Timothy was also given nothing to do. Look at verse 13. Until I come, devote yourselves to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. That's what it's all about. That's his job. That's our job. This is every preacher's job. This is anyone who's out there. Anyone who's there, this is what we do. But in the second letter to Timothy, Paul charged him with this. 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the, to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing of his kingdom. Verse 2. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. If we just came to tickle your ears, then we would be sinning against God. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. So we should be challenging you. We should be, and our self, you have to understand, again, I say you, but it all started with me because I'm putting this together, right? I'm spending this time, so I'm being rebuked. I'm being, I'm being challenged. I'm being encouraged. So our job is to do the same thing. Your job is to do the same thing. We don't want to make people feel, and we do it in a loving way, and I know there's a fine line. I, I know with me, I, I was telling Pastor Darrell the other day that, that I, I have a tendency that, that unbelievers, I have more patience with them than I, I have with people who say they're believers. Because you, pay, they should know better. Not believers are not going to know. So I can be more patient, but people who know it, so that's a problem that I have to deal with that I'm working on. It. And God rebukes me. He, 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 he tells me. He lets me know that I've got things to work on. The Spirit's in there. He's telling me these things. And I get convicted. We should never come to church. If we feel, if we come to church because we feel comfortable, then maybe one or two things are happening. Either you're not here for it, or we're doing a bad job. Like I said before, a lot of churches that are so-called pastors, they don't do this. They don't do this right here. They give more stories about anything. They might not they might mind me a little doctrine that's sprinkled into it, but they would rather give more fluff, more tickle in the ears, more about their heart desires and not what God desires. Paul goes on to verse 2. We're coming there, getting there. Paul in verse 2 goes this. For I decided there was nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. In other words, Paul said, look, I'm just telling the Corinthians, I just zeroed in on Christ. I just zeroed right in on the cross. 
my design, what God's going to do is just to preach him. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm here to do. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you straight, I'm going to give you straight the word. I'm not going to do it as a perfect man, right? Because he's not perfect. Paul's not perfect. None of us are perfect. I'm not going to do it because I'm, I'm perfect. I'm doing it because that's what I've called to do is preach. I'm going to just preach Christ crucified. I'm going to preach that he's a redeemer, that he's a savior. I'm not going to give you my opinion. I'm not going to give you human philosophy and wisdom. I'm just going to give you the word. That's what Paul is saying in verse 2. <coughs> now, he's saying that, that, there, that he's not denying the rest of the scriptures here, right? He just because in Acts 18, he says that for 18 months, he shared, he taught them the word of God. But his emphasis was on the cross. <coughs> And it means that by God's redemptive plan, this is what I'm going to share. But then he goes on to verses 3 through 5, and let me just read these verses to you. It says, And I was, I was with you in weakness and in fear and must trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words and wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and the power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul's let us know that, that he preached with God's power. It wasn't anything on him. Verse 3, all that we know of Paul, because if you look at verse 3, he says, I, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And you look at that verse, you say, of all that we know about Paul, this doesn't sound like him. The weakness that Paul's referring to is that when he came to Corinth was the weakness of the gospel, it, it, it's, it, which is really the power of God. And the fear and trembling, some have said it was referring to mental timidity or to physical shaking. I don't believe that either. But we do know that he preached boldly. So if that's the case, I don't think this is what this means. Living boldly, he counsels other believers to be bold in things. Let me just give you a couple, just so you know. Acts 13, 46. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly. Right? He, he, saying it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first. And he, so he spoke out boldly, right? But then Acts um, 19, 8. It goes, and he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly. So we know that it wasn't that. It wasn't the word. It was in himself. He used the phrase fear and trembling in several other passages too. So I want to put these together for you. And in each passage, it had to do with a deep concern over an important, urgent issue. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 7 5. And in this affection, affection for you is even greater as he remembers the obedience of you and all, and how you received him with fear and trembling. In Philippians 2 12, here. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only is it my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It has to do with anxiety that comes with something that's so very urgent. And Paul says, I was in such an urgency over you. I, I want you to understand this. I fear that you may not listen. You may go your own way, but the gospel is the only way. I am the way, the truth, and life, as the, we just read and we remember this in Acts, right? It happened in the end of cities. He'd been thrown out of Philippi, had run for his life. He was thrown out of Thessalonica, right? He had to run for his life. The Thessalonians followed him into Berea. He had to leave there. He got to Athens. He was about the end of his road. All this following, he gets to Mars Hills and he preaches. And there wasn't even a response. He lands in Corinth all alone. And he's very, very discouraged. He sees a city just dominated by sinfulness. Just a filthy place. And so in verse 4, he says it again. And in my speech and my message, we're not Paul's words of wisdom, but a demonstration of spirit and of power. In other words, what he says is, I didn't come with my own words, and I didn't come in my own power. I didn't want you to buy it into a philosophy. I want you to become new creatures. I, I didn't want you to put your faith in my opinions. I want you to put your faith in God, who's that's the only power that can transform you. This is what Paul is saying. Spurgeon said this, The power that is in the gospel does not lie in the elements of the preacher. Otherwise, men would be converters of souls. Would be the converters of souls. Nor does it lie in the preacher's learning. Otherwise, it consists in the wisdom of men. We might preach until our tongues rotted, until we would exhaust our lungs and die. But never a soul would be converted unless the Holy Spirit be with the word of God to give it the power to convert the soul. And that's what Paul is saying. I came to you not with a human message, but the testimony of God, the cross I give you. I came to you not with human power, but with divine power. The reason that your faith should not be staying in philosophy, but in the power of God. 
If the Corinthians would have come in faith and wisdom of men, even in Paul's wisdom, they might have changed intellectually, but they would have not changed spiritually. They would still have been spiritually dead, and Paul would not have been able to write them as saints and brothers. We know they were believers. The church, as I close, should not have divisions based on philosophy any more than should have divisions based on individuals. We are to be united around God's wisdom, not human wisdom. We are the ones in Jesus Christ and should be the one in his word and power and the fellowship of those that are his. Church, look to God in all circumstances. Look to his power. Men will fail you. Pastor Darren and I will fail you, fail you, but God will never. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your word. As to me, it was sharper than any two-edged sword. It cut me. So, Father, I pray, Lord God, as I share the word, I pray they didn't see me, they didn't hear me, but they saw you. I pray that each week that I, myself, or Pastor Darrell stands up here, that we always will preach Christ and crucified. That we will always point people to the cross. I pray for the ones who are here today, maybe online, who know the Lord, who, who is a father of God. I pray that they would preach Christ. They would share their testimony and give glory to God for what he's done. But also pray for the ones, Lord, who don't know you. Who have never put their faith and trust in you. All this that we spoke about may have meant nothing to them. But you're tugging at their heart. And my prayer, Lord God, is they would say yes to you. That they would believe in the death, burial, and resurrection. They would believe that, that if without you, they are destined for hell. But with you, their lives become a new creature and their life will spend eternity with you in heaven. So, Father, is there anyone here today or, or even online who's done that, Father God, I pray they would reach out to let us, myself or Pastor Darrell, know. Not that we could say anything differently, but to, to, to give God glory, give God all the glory, and to help them with their next steps, because the road will not be easy. But it will be the most glorifying. Because we have the presence of you. So thank you, Father, for all you do and all you will do. We ask this in your name.